Hi everybody, my name is Jeff Erickson from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I am here to talk to you today about the tragedy of being almost but not quite planar. I want to thank the Isaac Conference organizers for inviting me to speak um, and thank all of you for um, coming to my talk either in person or virtually. Um, and finally, I'd like to apologize for not being able to attend the conference in person. As much as I've loved my time visiting Korea, it just wasn't possible this year. So hopefully this video will, will be worth your time. I should be available on Zoom after the video plays to answer any questions. So, for the past 15 years or so, I've been studying algorithms for graphs that can be embedded either in the plane or on other surfaces. This uh, line of research is really motivated by the fact that planar graphs um, are extremely natural objects that have lots of cool properties. Just to remind everybody, um, a graph is planar if it's possible to draw the graph in a plane with vertices as points and edges as curves between those points, such that no two edges cross in the drawing. Um, so examples of planar graphs include convex polyhedra, which have been studied since antiquity, um, Delaunay triangulations and other structures that are constructed in computational geometry, political and geographic maps, um, and solid models as long as the objects don't have any interesting holes in them. Planar graphs have lots of interesting combinatorial properties, the most familiar of which is Euler's formula. In any planar drawing of a planar graph, the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is always equal to two. Um, an immediate consequence of Euler's formula is that planar graphs are sparse. If I've got n vertices in my planar graph, then it has at most three n minus six edges. Um, there's a lovely duality structure buried in here. For any planar drawing, I can construct a dual um, planar graph by putting a vertex in every face of the original planar graph and connecting two dual vertices if the corresponding faces share an edge. Um, and this opens up all sorts of structure. Essentially, whenever you're given one planar graph, you're really given two. Planar graphs are minor closed. If you delete or contract an edge in a planar graph, the result is still planar. And a bit more um, uh, subtle, um, sparse separators, it's possible to delete about square root of n vertices um, from any n vertex planar graph so that the uh, graph splits into two components, each of which has only a constant fraction of the original vertices. There are lots of other properties. This is just a representative list. And these combinatorial properties immediately imply, or not necessarily immediately, uh, but they eventually imply a bunch of faster algorithms uh, for classical problems where, because of planarity, you can make the algorithm either faster or simpler than for general graphs. It's possible to compute minimum spanning trees in linear time using the classical algorithm by Barufka just because um, gra uh, planar graphs are sparse and minor closed. Um, recursive application of, of uh, separators um, allows you to compute shortest paths in planar graphs in linear time. And in fact, even if you've got negative edge weights, you can still compute shortest paths in near linear time. Um, and then as another example with uh, different divide and conquer strategies, it's possible to compute minimum cuts in planar flow networks in near linear time, this time with a, with a double log. Now, these are all, you know, really lovely results, but I grew up reading um, mathematics books that had pictures of toruses and other surfaces in them, and I've always finding topology um, incredibly fascinating. So whenever I see these problems, I've always been motivated to ask, well, what happens if we move up to graphs on more complicated surfaces? And these more complicated surface graphs are also interesting and cool and natural. Um, so I'm going to focus primarily on graphs on the torus, and again, the graph is toroidal if it's possible to draw on the torus so that no two edges cross. These things have also been studied a little less than since antiquity. That one in the upper left there was, in fact, drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. Um, but they show up in natural studies of generalizations of convex polyhedra. They show up in geometric models that happen to have only one hole in them. They show up in the study of, of periodic structures and finite element analysis and scheduling and so forth. Um, 
These graphs are also cool. They also obey a variant of Euler's formula where now instead of getting V minus E plus F equals two, you get V minus E plus F equals zero. Um, uh, toroidal graphs are still sparse. Uh, when you have N vertices, they have at most three N edges. You still have duality because everything locally looks like it's in the plane. That's how surfaces behave and duality is defined entirely locally. Um, torus graphs are still minor closed, deleting and contracting edges still leaves a torus graph. And they still have sparse separators, a different constants, but um, slightly more complicated algorithms. But still, you can delete about square root of n vertices and cut the graph into constant fraction-sized pieces. All of these results generalize to graphs on more complex surfaces with some dependence on the, the topological complexity or genus of the underlying surface. And similarly, these properties imply fast algorithms for torus graphs, um, minimum spanning trees in linear time, shortest paths in linear time, shortest paths with negative edges in near linear time, minimum cuts in near linear time. And again, with some hidden dependence on the genus, all of these results generalize to graphs on more complicated surfaces. And it's tempting to, to conjecture after playing with this for a while and seeing all these positive examples that this is a general trend that any algorithm that works in the plane can be generalized to work on more complex surfaces. But this is unfortunately just not true. And what I want to talk about today are three examples that I find particularly glaring um, all based on classical results in combinatorial topology and graph theory, but where we have lovely, elegant algorithms in the plane, but as soon as we go to more complex surfaces, everything falls apart. Um, these are personal choices. I'm taking the liberty of talking about things that I think are cool. Um, in particular, I think the planar results are beautiful, and if that's all you get out of the talk, then I'll be very happy. Um, and, but these are all problems where I don't think it's embarrassing that the, the problems are open on more complex surfaces. That said, I can't claim that any of these problems are important. I'm generally motivated by exploring the limits of my tools rather than trying to um, do important things. Uh, but nevertheless, I think they're fun and they're cool. So let's get started. The first example I want to talk about are what are called Gauss codes. So um, Carl Friedrich Gauss who is a German physicist and mathematician, and later Peter Guthrie Tate, who is a, a Scottish um, mathematician and physicist, both studied knots. Now, knot theory didn't exist. These two people arguably invented knot theory, um, but they started the way everybody would imagine you'd start studying knots by trying to enumerate them, trying to draw pictures of knots and just figure out what all the options are Let's see what your possibilities are before thinking about any structure. And so they started developing what people normally call knot diagrams, but before they got to knot diagrams, they just wanted to understand the structure of curves. Now what you see down at the bottom of the screen here is not a knot table, it's a curve table. It's just how do you draw squiggles in the plane in fundamentally different ways with increasing numbers of self-intersections. And they, so both Gauss and Tate were interested in doing the systematic enumeration of curves. And both Gauss and Tate did this by developing a symbolic representation of curves. Now, just to be clear, the type of curve that we're interested in, I'm calling a generic planar curve. This is a closed curve that could self-intersect, but it always self-intersects transversely and always at a double point. You never have the same point being revisited more than twice, and you don't have self-tangencies or repeated arcs or anything like that. So the image of the curve is a four regular planar graph, possibly with parallel edges and possibly with loops. So Gauss said, okay, let's label the points where the curve crosses itself. We'll orient the curve and choose an arbitrary base point. Here the arrows indicate the orientation of the curve and the white arrow on the far left indicates the base point. And then we'll list the crossing points along the curve in the order that they occur. This is the Gauss code. Now, clearly the Gauss code depends on the choice of labels, the choice of orientation, and the choice of base point. But equivalent Gauss codes for the same curve, that, that, that equivalence is easy to figure out, easy to factor out. Um, the harder problem is 
not all strings that look like Gauss codes actually are Gauss codes. Every Gauss code is a string where every character appears exactly twice or not at all, but not every such string is a Gauss code. And so Gauss asked, and then Tate asked, um, how do you tell? Given a Gauss code, how do you tell whether it really corresponds to a planar curve or not? And again, the motivating um, story here is they want to, Tate wanted to enumerate all possible curves with a given number of double points. And his strategy was, let's enumerate these codes, throw out the ones that are bad, and that'll give us our list of examples. I want to point out here that when I say curve, I really don't mean a single curve, but a topological equivalence class of curves. Deforming the plane and deforming the curve around it um, has no effect on the Gauss code, which is exactly what Gauss and Tate wanted. So Gauss quickly realized that one condition that Gauss codes of real curves has have to satisfy is a parity condition. Any matching pair of symbols in the Gauss code must have an even number of other symbols in between them. So, for example, between the two A's in this particular Gauss code, there are eight other symbols. Between the two B's, there are 12 other symbols. Between the two C's, there are four. And this is relatively easy to prove using a winding number argument. I won't do that, but I'll, I'll show another, another view of this condition that maybe will make the proof a little bit more accessible. This was something that was proposed about 40 or 50 years later um, by Julius Nagy, um, uh, who was a Hungarian mathematician. He defined a directed graph based on the Gauss code, which I'll call the Nagy graph. And the idea is that I'll put directed edges between each, of the two, each adjacent pair of symbols in the Gauss code, but alternating directions backward, forward, backward, forward, backward, forward. The parity condition says every character occurs once at an even in position and once in an odd position. So at the even positions, the Nagy graph has two incoming edges, and at the odd position, the node in the Nagy graph has two outgoing edges. So re-identifying the symbols back together, I end up, hopefully, with a graph where every vertex has in degree two and out degree two. In other words, this is a graph that supports an Euler tour back to the bridges of Konigsberg and said in the early 1700s, um, that was actually still being used here. Um, so this Nagy graph must be Eulerian. Um, unfortunately, this parity condition is not sufficient. Both Gauss and Tate came up with multiple examples of Gauss code that satisfy the parity condition, but are still not compatible with any actual curve. Presumably, they figured this out by just trying to do brute force enumeration of all possible um, configurations of curve. Uh, so they didn't solve the problem. And this is a very rare case where we can say Gauss posed the problem, but Gauss could not solve the problem. And probably part of the reason for that is graph theory didn't exist yet. So um, the Naj gave a partial solution, but it doesn't quite work. The first real solution to this problem was proposed by the topologist Max Dane in the mid-1930s. So Dane made a couple of observations first. He said, well, if the code really does correspond to a curve, then an Euler tour of the Nagy graph traces around the curve in a, in a different closed curve that touches itself at the vertices rather than crossing itself at the vertices. And if a curve that cr touches itself but never crosses itself is called weakly simple. This means if I perturb the vertex just a little bit at the nodes, um, the, the curve resolves into a simple closed curve, which by the Jordan curve theorem has an interior and an exterior. And that means that if the code really is valid, I should be able to classify the nodes as either being uh, interior, the curve touches itself through the interior of the curve, those are the nodes labeled in green, um, or exterior, um, the curve touches itself on the outside of the curve, those are the nodes um, colored in red on the slide. So um, in order to test this condition, um, Dane came up with a different code for encoding the graph. Rather than code encoding the crossings of the curve, he encodes the, the points of self-tangency in an Euler tour of the Nagy graph. 
Um, and remember, this can be done purely combinatorially. I don't need the embedding. I don't need to know that it's a curve. I can do it just from the symbols. Okay, so I get a different thing, which I'll call a Dane code. Now from the Dane code, Dane derived another graph, which is universally known as a Gauss diagram, even though it was not invented by Gauss. As far as I can tell, its first use was by P Peterson of Peterson graph fame. Um, nevertheless, um, Gauss gets credit for everything, so that's the rule. We have to call it a Gauss diagram. The idea is I set up a circle with the, label, the, the symbols in the Dane um, code around the circle, and then I connect any two nodes on that circle by an arc that connects um, the, the, the two copies of that symbol. Um, and this Dane code must be planar. The, 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 the Gauss diagram must be planar. This is what Dane argued. Um, and the reason is that the planar embedding of the Gauss diagram is really just a deformation of this weakly simple curve that we got um, by smoothing out all of the, um, taking the Euler tour of the, the, the Nage graph. So each of those exterior red arcs is what you get if you take the blue curve on the left and stretch it open into a circle, the red exterior self-touching points stretch out into red exterior arcs. The green interior self-touching points stretch out into green interior arcs. So we need to somehow take the arcs of the interlacement graph and divide them into two classes, the ones that we want to draw on the inside of the circle and the ones that we want to draw on the outside of the circle. These correspond to interior and exterior self-tangencies, respectively. And um, the, the one thing we know is that if two of these arcs are interlaced, they must be on opposite sides of the circle. They must one be interior and the other exterior. And so this naturally defines what we call the interlacement graph. You have one node for every symbol, and you have an edge between two symbols if and only if the arcs in the Gauss diagram are interlaced, or those that pair of symbols is interlaced in the Dane code. In this case, A and D are connected because those symbols appear A, D, A, D in the, the Dane code, as opposed to A, A, D, D, or A, D, D, A. They're, they're interlaced. So if we discover that this graph is bipartite, we can use the partition of the vertices to classify the um, edges of the, the, the arcs in the Gauss diagram, which in turn can then be used to reconstruct a curve that's consistent with the original Gauss code. So here's the algorithm um, all glued together. Um, we take the Gauss code from it, we construct this um, hopefully um, Eulerian Nage graph um, has in degree two and out degree two at every node. Um, if that fails to produce an Eulerian graph, then we know the Gauss code isn't valid. And we construct any Euler tour and produce a Dane self-touching code. All of this takes linear time. Then we build the interlacement graph and test it for bipartiteness. Um, the interlacement graph could have a quadratic number of edges, so the brute force algorithm that constructs it at n squared time is the best one can hope for. And then once you've got the partition, um, you can rebuild the curve as suggested by this figure in linear time. So the whole thing works in small polynomial time. And this algorithm is actually still used by people who do build knot tables to test whether Gauss codes are actually correspond to real curves. Um, uh, and in fact, um, even the n squared term can be simplified to linear. Um, this was done by Rosenstiel and Tarjan um, in 1984. Uh, and the idea is they don't actually build the interlacement graph explicitly. Um, I believe they end up computing a spanning forest of the complement of the, 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 the graph, which is just enough information to be able to prove that the graph is bipartite and, and partition the vertices. So great, linear time, quadratic if you don't want to be fancy. But then this raises a natural question, which was actually asked by Dane in his original paper. Um, uh, every Gauss code actually corresponds to a curve on some surface, it turns out. Um, how quickly can we recognize Gauss codes for curves on more complicated surfaces, for example, the torus? 
And one thing, playing around with this one quickly, realizes that neither of the conditions, either parity or interlacement, that are required for a code to represent a planar curve are necessary for a code to represent a curve on the torus. So on the screen here is an example of a closed curve on the torus that has Gauss code ABAB. This fails the parity condition and so is not compatible with any curve in the plane, but there's a curve on the torus. Now again, not every Gauss code that is incompatible with something in the plane is compatible with something in the torus. It's just we don't know simple conditions like this that work. Now, it turns out if you could record the sign of every crossing into the Gauss code itself, everything would be easy. So when you're walking along the curve and you hit a crossing point, if it looks like you're crossing the other branch of the curve from left to right, we'll count that as a negative crossing. If you're crossing from right to left, we'll count that as a positive crossing. And so every crossing occurs once with each sign. If you knew the signs, this would actually be enough to reconstruct the faces of the drawing of the curve. And then you could use Euler's formula is the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces two. If so, this is a planar curve. Is it zero? Then it's a torus curve. If it's minus two, then it's a double torus curve and so on. But without the signs, the only algorithm we have is try all possible sign patterns. And uh, there are n possible choices for signs. Uh, sorry, there are n vertices, and for each one, you have a binary choice of whether the positive or negative crossing comes first. Um, so I have two to the n possibilities. That, try each one. That, that is what we know how to do. So, open question. Um, how quickly can we check whether a given Gauss code describes a generic closed curve on the torus? I think it's plausible that this can happen in polynomial, maybe even in linear time, um, but I don't know how to do it. And more importantly, I, I, I think it's really unlikely that this problem is NP-hard. There's just not enough structure here. On the other hand, if I want to find the minimum genus surface that supports a generic closed curve with a given Gauss code, that seems much more likely to be NP-hard. But again, I don't know how to prove that. My intuition here is really derived from algorithms for drawing graphs on surfaces. There are linear time algorithms for drawing graphs in the plane, for drawing graphs in the torus, for drawing graphs in the two-hole torus, and so on. But if I want to find the minimum genus surface on which I can draw a graph, that's NP-hard. So that's the first open question. Let me move on to the second one. Now the first one, uh, that's, uh, that probably was unfamiliar to most of the people in the, in the room. Um, this one is going to be very familiar. This uh, open question is based on a classical theorem by Carl Menger, who proved in 1926. Um, here's one version of Menger's theorem. Um, let G be a graph with two distinct vertices, S and T. Either G contains K pairwise edge disjoint paths from S to T, or some set of less than K edges separates S from T. Now, anyone who's uh, taught an undergraduate algorithms class or graduate algorithms class probably, um, hopefully, recognizes this as a, an unweighted version of the max flow min cut theorem. So Menger didn't think about algorithms. It was 1920. Not that many people were thinking about algorithms at the time, aside from Dane and a few others. Um, but in the 1950s, um, uh, when uh, Thomas Harris, um, I believe his first name, Theodore Harris, excuse me, um, suggested the formulation of the max flow problem to Ford and Fulkerson, um, they were really trying to solve this for real to model flows in planar graphs, specifically the rail networks um, for the Warsaw Pact countries in Eastern Europe. So um, there's a very natural question that comes out of both uh, uh, Menger's uh, theorem and uh, the Ford and Fulkerson stuff, which is given an undirected planar graph with two distinct vertices S and T, how quickly can we find the maximum number of edge disjoint paths from S to T? Um, and what I'll describe here is a beautiful algorithm due to Karsten Weihe that was published in the late 1990s um, that shows some structure that gets exploited in more general flow algorithms, but I think is, is particularly simple and elegant 
um, and runs in linear time. So Vaya's algorithm breaks down into four parts. There's a bit of pre-processing. First, I need to make the graph look directed. Um, uh, the main pre-processing step is uh, I need to get rid of all clockwise cycles in my graph. Um, then the main algorithm is called write for search. It's essentially a maze following algorithm where I stick my right hand on the wall and only walk down things that I could, uh, the right hand leads me to. And then at the end, there's a bit of post-processing. So I'll, I'll walk through an example here. So you suppose you're given this undirected planar graph. I've got two nodes, S and T. I'm going to assume that I have a drawing and moreover that T is on the outer face of that drawing. These are um, relatively easy things to do in linear time. So I'll, I'll replace every undirected edge in this graph with a pair of directed edges or darts. From a data structure's point of view, this is a no-op. Um, the adjacency list data structure that represents your graph probably already has two records for every edge, one in the adjacency list of each endpoint. So just interpret the data structure as being a directed graph. The main pre-processing stage is that I need to remove clockwise cycles. And the way that I'm going to do that is to use sort of graphical version of winding number. I'm going to label every face in my graph uh, according to the number of edges you need to cross to leave that face and enter the outer face. So the depth of the face is zero if it's the outer face, one if it's adjacent to the outer face, two if it's adjacent to a, a face with depth one, and so on. And then I'll identify every dart that has a deeper face on its right side. Um, the right side with respect to the direction of that dart represented by these little sort of half arrowheads here. Um, so the, the dart on the far right that's pointing down, its right side is in the left of the drawing because um, you need to be facing downward to judge right left. And I'm gonna take these edges that collectively um, a, a set of cycles, and I'm going to reverse them. Now my original undirected planar graph, every edge is represented by two darts, but for some edges, those two darts point in different directions, and for other edges, those two darts point in the same direction. Okay, fine. This is what we're gonna start the main algorithm with. And as I said, the main algorithm, right for search, is really like a maze following algorithm. I'm gonna start wandering around the graph from S following four simple rules. The first rule is I'm never going to traverse a dart more than once. The second, the right hand rule says, whenever I walk into a vertex except S, um, the way that I leave that vertex is I follow the next unused dart out of that vertex in counterclockwise order around the vertex. I'll show an example of this. It'll make sense in a second. The third rule is whenever I reach the target vertex T, I teleport back to S. And the last rule is if I ever get stuck at S, if I ever find myself at S with no unused outgoing darts, I'm done. The algorithm's finished. Okay, so here's um, a working example again. I've got a token, that yellow dot there is sitting on node S, and I picked an outgoing dart marked in blue, um, and I moved the token down that dart, and now I've entered a new vertex. To figure out how to leave, I scan counterclockwise um, around that vertex, starting with the incoming dart until I find an outgoing dart that I haven't used before. I send the dart down, the, the token down that dart, look counterclockwise, find an outgoing dart, and so on. And so uh, eventually, my token reaches the target vertex T. Now remember, the rule is I'm never allowed to use a dart more than once. So to simplify the picture, I'm going to erase those darts and then I'm going to magically transport my token back to the start vertex S. That's the first path we found from S to T. Oh, well, let's do it again. Here's a path from S to T, again, following the right-hand rule, and I teleport back to S. Here's a third path. Now notice it's doubling back like this because it can't use those darts on the right edge of the outer face anymore. I've used them before, so it has no choice but to double back. And then here's the last iteration. Now I've stopped at this point to point out, here I'm entering that vertex that the token is on for the second time during this phase of the algorithm, but I've used the dart pointing to the left before, so I have to use the other dart pointing to the left. 
And he, um, again, I'm at a vertex that I've visited before in this phase. I can't use the dart, the dart leaving up and to the left. I have to go um, down instead. Eventually, I find myself back at S. None of those edges help me get to T, so I can just delete them. Um, and at this point, I'm stuck. There are no more outgoing darts at S, and so the algorithm is done. I just found four paths from S to T. I, I, I went through four phases where I reached T and teleported back to S. That tells me that the eventual answer here is going to be four paths. Um, but if I actually want to construct the four paths, I need to do a bit of post-processing. It's relatively simple. I take all of the darts that I reversed. Those are the ones marked in red in the pre-processing part. And I take all the darts that I used during the main phase of the algorithm, those are the ones marked in blue, and I cancel things out. So you'll notice some edges, both of the opposing darts got used. Eh, it's the same as not using the edge at all. Um, some edges, one of the darts got used in one direction, the other got used in the other direction, and one of the darts actually got used backwards. So um, I'm going to take the, the dart that was used both forward and backward, both in red and blue, and just cancel that out. This counts as using the edge once. And what I get is this collection of darts. This is describing a flow with value four from S to T. And so now using standard techniques, I can decompose this flow into um, four edge disjoint paths and project those paths back to my original undirected graph. So, here again is the algorithm. Make the graph directed, remove all clockwise cycles using depth contours, run right for search, keep your hand on the right wall when you are in your T, teleport back to S, never use the same dart more than once, and then a bit of post-processing. So I want to provide a little bit of intuition about why this algorithm works. So the first thing to observe is that when we took the graph, the undirected graph, and, and replaced every direct every edge with two opposing darts, we created an Eulerian graph. Every node has the same number of incoming darts as it has outgoing darts. Similarly, when we removed all the clockwise cycles, we reversed um, darts along a bunch of cycles in the graph, so the same number of incoming darts at any vertex were reversed as outgoing darts from that vertex. So the graph is still Eulerian. And that means the right-hand rule part of the algorithm can never get stuck anywhere except at S. If I walk into a vertex, there's always a way to walk out. Second bit of intuition, this is gonna be short of a complete proof, but just illustrates the main ideas. Whenever a right for search traverses a cycle, as it did in the last phase of the main algorithm, um, you know a few things about the cycle. First, the cycle doesn't contain the target vertex T. If it did, I wouldn't have kept going around the cycle. I would have stopped and then teleported to S. Um, second, because there are no clockwise cycles after pre-processing, this cycle isn't clockwise. It must be counterclockwise. And now by the Jordan curve theorem, it has an inside and an outside, but T's on the outer face, so it's on the outside. And the outside of a counterclockwise cycle is on the right. If I walk around that cycle holding up my right hand, I'm going to swat the target vertex as I go by. But because of the right hand rule, all darts leaving the cycle to the right have already been used, except maybe at the vertex where the cycle begins and ends if you start outside. Um, and so what this implies is that no edge of the cycle, and in fact no edge inside of the cycle, I really should say no dart inside or on the cycle, lies on a path from S to T. So I can delete these and it has no effect on the number of paths from S to T. Now careful implementation of Aya's algorithm runs in linear time. The only part that's non-trivial is if you've got a high degree vertex, you need to use a union fine data structure to implement the right hand rule in constant amortized time per um, step. Um, but VIA uses an off-the-shelf uh, data structure for that. It's just the standard um, union find structure you all know and love. Um, and this idea of getting rid of clockwise cycles and then working within um, that residual graph 
ums generalizes to um, computing maximum flows in directed planar networks with arbitrary capacities, possibly different capacities in different directions, um, using a technique called leftmost augmenting paths. Now, it's a little bit weird that the right-hand rule generalizes to the leftmost augmenting path. You'll just have to trust me that that's the way that it works out. Um, uh, so uh, by following the leftmost augmenting path, this is actually a, a heuristic that was proposed by Ford and Fulkerson in their original paper. It was proved to work when S and T both lie on the outer face, but has seen in the early 80s. A first attempt at an algorithm by Via in 97, it works, provided the algorithm satisfies some additional conditions. But really, this was settled by um, Cora Boradale and Phil Klein in 2009 an absolutely beautiful algorithm um, that implements the leftmost augmenting path rule in n log n time. Um, there was some follow-up work. I described a, a slightly simpler formulation and analysis of their algorithm in 2010. And then uh, David Eisenstadt and Phil Klein made some um, further generalizations and improvements in 2013. So here it is. We can compute disjoint paths in linear time. We can compute maximum flows in n log n time, provided the graph lives in the plane. So what happens when we're no longer in the plane? Well, if we're given a graph on the torus and we want to know how many short um, disjoint paths there are from one vertex to another, we can still run Vaya's algorithm. We can still compute depth contours. We just label one of these faces as being the outer face, compute depths, we can do the pre-processing. It gets rid of all the clockwise stuff. We can still do the right-hand rule because it's completely local. Counterclockwise around a vertex makes sense on the torus because locally it looks like the plane. So the algorithm still runs, still runs in linear time. It just doesn't compute the right answer. Um, and the, the reason why the algorithm breaks down is that intuition I had about cycles no longer holds. Fundamentally, the problem is there's no more Jordan curve theorem. On the plane, a simple closed curve breaks, has an inside component and an outside component, and you can't get from one to the other without crossing the curve. On the torus, you have a curve like the blue one I'm showing here that wraps through the hole. Um, I can go from one side to the other just by going around the hole the other way. Um, this cycle that I've drawn is neither clockwise nor counterclockwise, so getting rid of clockwise cycles still leaves other ways to get around. Um, and another really fundamental obstruction is there's no such thing as a leftmost augmenting path on the torus. Different augmenting paths can wind around the torus in different ways, and there's no principled way of saying which one of these is further to the left of the other. So this, the planar technology just doesn't work. Um, this is a problem that has well-known polynomial time algorithms. So it's not like the Gauss code problem where we're immediately in exponential land. Um, but the fastest combinatorial algorithms we know basically just use the fact that the graph, these graphs are sparse. There's no, none of the topological tools that other algorithms for surface graphs have built are useful here. Um, if we want to compute edge disjoint paths, the running time is about n to the 1.5. If we want to compute maximum flows, the running time is roughly quadratic. Um, these are basically textbook algorithms, and this is really what you would want, the best you'd want to use in practice. Now, in theory, if you want to wander away from combinatorial algorithms, there are a couple of options. Um, there's one that's specialized to surface graphs that Aaron Chambers and Mirnayeri and I developed in 2009 that runs in near linear time. And there's another more recent bombshell result that came out in March of 2022 by Chen, King, Liu, Peng, Props, Gutenberg, and Sach Deva that actually computes maximum flows in arbitrary graphs in near linear time in the number of edges. Both of these algorithms are based on different magical properties of linear programming. Um, my algorithm with Aaron and Amir um, solves an implicit linear program to compute the right homology class using the ellipsoid method. So it's using topology in a non-trivial way, but it's really ugly. Um, and the more recent algorithm is even uglier. It uses interior point methods via complex dynamic graph data structures from minimum ratio cycles. Um, uh, neither of these are algorithms that human beings can implement in any reasonable amount of time. The Chen et al. paper is 112 pages long, and it is not self-contained. 
from a theoretical perspective, these are also um, somewhat lacking because they assume that your capac the capacities of your edges must be integers. Otherwise, they just don't work. So, open question. We have these beautiful, simple algorithms for disjoint paths and flows in the plane, and we've just got nothing in the surface. It's not nothing. You've still got polynomial time. And yeah, in theory, you can get near linear time, but you really have to sweat. And this is not nice. So what I'd really like to know is whether there's a combinatorial algorithm um, to compute edge disjoint paths in graphs on the torus in near linear time. Um, combinatorial basically means eh, you can add and subtract and multiply and do linear algebra pivoty things, but nothing that involves numerics. Um, another way of saying exactly the same thing, um, is there an algorithm to compute maximum flows in graphs on the torus in near linear time in the real RAM model? So as a bred, born and bred computational geometer, it's completely natural to me to think about algorithms that manipulate real numbers exactly in constant time. And this is in fact what we already do in textbook presentations of things like Dijkstra's algorithm and Ford Fulkerson and Gaussian elimination. Um, we just analyze the number of arithmetic operations. So can you do that here with maximum flows in the torus as we can in the plane? And finally, one frustrating grace note to this is if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned minimum cuts as a problem that can be solved in near linear time, not only in the planar, planar case, but in more complicated surface graphs. And in fact, there is a combinatorial algorithm to compute minimum ST cuts for graphs on the torus. So I can tell you the value of the flow. I can tell you the number of edge disjoint paths in near linear time. I just can't construct the paths themselves. Oof. So that's the end of my, my second problem. The last one that I want to talk about is a, is a bit more unnatural. It's a bit more arbitrary. Um, it's a bit more technical. But the state of ignorance that is attached to the problem is much, much bigger than either of the other ones. Um, and this is a, a problem related to uh, a topological property called homotopy. So homotopy is um, a formalization of the idea of continuous deformation. If I've got a curve scribbled down the plane, I can continuously deform it until the curve becomes a circle and then shrinks down to a point. And so more generally, if I have two curves on a surface, I call them homotopic if one can be continuously deformed to the other on the surface. And in particular, I'm interested in contractible closed curves. So a closed curve on a surface is contractible if it can be continuously deformed to a single point. The green curve here can't. It's hooked around one of the cycles. The blue curve is also not contractible. If I try to deform it down to a single point, say by pulling it off to the right or the left, it'll get hooked around one of the holes in the double torus. And you, it, can, it won't actually work. The red curve, on the other hand, is contractible. You can imagine shrinking it down to a point inside that disk that it bounds on the right-hand side. So. Um, one of the earliest algorithms in computational topology um, was by Max Dane, the person who gave us um, Dane codes and the interlacement property. Um, in 1911, he described an algorithm for deciding whether a given curve on a surface is um, contractible or not. And in the context of graphs on surfaces, this has been um, uh, uh, was turned into a couple of different algorithms, one by Day and Guhan, 1999, and another by Kim Whittlesey and me in 2013, that if I'm given a graph on any surface at all, and then I'm given a closed walk in that graph, I can think of that closed walk as being a closed curve on the surface. I can determine whether that closed walk is contractible in linear time, linear in the complete description of the input, both the surface and the curve together. Again, this is a relatively simple algorithm. I don't want to talk about it in detail because we actually understand how to make this work on arbitrary surfaces. Here's the annoying problem. Suppose we're given a directed graph on a surface and every edge is colored either red or blue. I want to search through this graph until I can find 
closed walk that is contractible on the surface and it has more red edges than blue edges. How quickly can I do this? So this is a problem that came up in a, a technical paper that um, my PhD student Yipu Wang and I published last year. Um, uh, and for certain types of surfaces, we know exactly how to do this. So if the surface that the graph is drawn on is the plane or the sphere, then every closed walk is contractible. And so really what we're asking, is there a cycle that has more red edges than blue edges? And by giving the red edges negative weight negative one and the blue edges weight positive one, this becomes finding negative cycles in a planar graph. And this can be done um, in near linear time using one of those shortest path algorithms that I referred to earlier in the talk. If the graph is embedded on the torus, uh, then there's a connection to homology that implies by LP duality that, that you can reduce this problem to computing a maximum flow the second problem that I talked about um, in a graph on the torus. So we can solve this problem in not near linear time combinatorially, but still small polynomial time or near linear time if you want to do some linear programming magic. But what happens if the curve is drawn on a double torus, the surface that I have shown here? We don't know. This problem is open. And when I say open, I really mean the problem is open. I mean, we, we don't know whether there's a near linear time algorithm. This seems a little bit ambitious, but we, we, we don't know if there's a polynomial time algorithm. Um, we also don't know whether the problem is NP hard. And in fact, we don't know any algorithm at all for this problem. We do not know whether this problem is decidable. It boggles the mind. I don't I think there's any possibility that this problem is undecidable. It's too simple. But we don't even know how to prove like more general versions. Like let's imagine that I have an arbitrary genus surface um, and I'm allowing the edges to have weights. What I'm really looking for is a contractible closed walk with negative weight. Um, that I could conceivably think of as being undecidable if the genus is large enough. But genus two, where there's just plus one and minus one, that can't be undecidable, but we don't know of an algorithm. And we also don't know of a hardness result. We know literally nothing about the complexity of this problem. So that's my last um, embarrassing open problem. Um, I want to conclude uh, here. Um, the, I guess the first thing is here's some open problems, go off and work on them, um, have fun. But um, if you, aside from the specific problems themselves, um, one of the messages that I hope you got about this from this talk is something that I, I think probably everyone here already believes. Algorithms are really fun. Algorithms are beautiful and elegant. Uh, they're, they're a joy to play with, but sometimes they're really hard. Things that look like they should generalize from very similar um, settings sometimes don't. Similarly, topology has a lot of beautiful structure. It's really fun to play with. There's a lot of elegance there. Um, it's very satisfying results that fall out of it. But again, sometimes topology makes things very, very hard. Um, and the last thing that I hope you get out of this um, a lot of these problems came out of um, my habit of reading old papers. I've actually read all the old papers by Dane and by Gauss and by Naj and by um, Menger and by Tate. Um, and there's a lot of cool stuff buried in there that people have forgotten. There are a lot of algorithms that probably I think should be better known. There are a lot of um, natural problems that, that um, come out of reading those papers. Um, so it's hard because sometimes those papers are written in German or French or Latin um, and uh, you get really good at Google Translate. Um, but sometimes it's really, it, there's a lot of cool stuff there and uh, it can lead not only to enjoyable but productive work. So with that, I want to thank everybody for your time and attention um, and hopefully I'm standing by on Zoom to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference.